the idea that life is short, but life is also long. Like life is, life is short, so live it quickly, live it now, but also realize that you can change directions many, many times throughout your life. And when you look back, they're going to look like you know, blips on the timeline. You know, they're going to be pretty small moments compared to the whole long lifeline. Are you ready? All right. <laughs> Welcome to the Remote Work and Travel Show. I'm your host, Nora Dunn, AKA the Professional Hobo. And in this series, I speak with ordinary people who have extraordinary travel lifestyles and remote careers to get the real dirt on what it's like to travel long-term while working abroad. Now, speaking of long-term travel and working abroad, if you were planning your own long-term trip, I highly recommend you check out the description or the show notes for a link to a free checklist of 10 things to do before you travel long-term. This is a, an essential part of your travel planning process. It will help you cover the bases to make sure that you are traveling effectively, safely, securely, and I'm willing to bet there's going to be at least one or two things in there that perhaps you haven't thought of or perhaps that you didn't have the same solution that are in that checklist. So do check it out. And in the meantime, I'd like to introduce my guest today, who is Jason Robinson. As a working class kid from Ohio, Jason didn't even realize that moving away from his home state was an option until he was in his 20s. At age 39, he'd only been to two countries outside of the US. And he always wanted to travel, so he figured there was no time like the present. He adopted an experiment mindset. And a few years and many methodical experiments later, he eventually transitioned into becoming a full-time location independent nomad. He details a lot of these experiments in his first book, The Beginner Traveler's Guide to Going Nomad. It's full of tough love and tips and strategies to help people finally kickstart their travel lifestyle. Now, Jason also had to dig himself out of $50,000 in debt in his 30s before he launched this new lifestyle. So he's a proponent of simple but effective budgeting. And in late 2020, at the age of 42, and of course in the midst of the COVID pandemic, he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, adding a whole new element to the full-time travel lifestyle. And we're going to get into this and a whole lot more. But first, welcome to the show, Jason. Uh, Thank you. Good to be here. Good to see you. Now, I want to start off with life transitions because you, of course, you were in your late 30s when you decided to make a, a pretty significant life transition in your in your lifestyle and your career. Uh, I was 30 when I sold everything to travel long term. And I found certainly when I did it, I would imagine when you did it as well. And for many people who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s and even 60s who are looking at making a big lifestyle change. One of the big objections I often hear is it's too late. It's too late for me to make a big change. It's too I, I I'm too old. I'm too set in my ways. Or you know it, it will be dangerous from a career perspective. So it, it's I'm wondering what was happening for you in your life when you decided to make this career transition, and and what have you done since then? Um, so I always knew that there were options for traveling. Late in my twenties, some of my friends around me. Uh, started traveling kind of crazy. Like uh, I had, I had a friend and his uh, fiance who sold everything and traveled Eurasia for eight months on like eighteen thousand dollars and started to learn about hostels and all these things. So I, the, the seeds were planted early for me. Um, but again, I grew up just not traveling. So uh, having seen those things when I was early thirties, I tried my first hostel. I tried couch surfing. Very slowly started touching these worlds of travel, but domestically in the United States. Um, and, you know, cyclically with my business, I, I, I became a freelancer, contractor, self-employed, um, however you want to call it, in my late 20s. Uh, but I was always very dependent on the place. I was in Charlotte, North Carolina. I had clients that were large architectural clients in Charlotte, and it was kind of tying me to that place. Essentially, after cycle after cycle of these big projects, I realized that I was going to need to get out from under them if I wanted to try this, you know, this world travel thing and end it to ebb in that direction. Um, so middle to late thirties, uh, my dog Brody, who was with me for 16 and a half years, finally, um, took off. And that was you know, kind of what allowed me to open up my life and say, okay, if you're going to do it, this is the time to start doing it. Um, and, you know, to, to talk to your question about, you know, people saying that you're kind of late in life or it's too late to get started. I was just talking to some, quite a few people in the past couple of days about that theory. And, yeah, in reality, those of us, like if we assume our adult life starts at 20 years old, at 35, you're literally less than two thirds through your adult life. I mean, assuming you're going to live to 70, 80 years old, you know, you're maybe a quarter of the way through your adult life. So 
you know, there's, there's many ways to look at that and to, to kind of rationalize, no, you know, life is very long. I, I love the, the idea that life is short, but life is also long. Like life is, life is short, so live it quickly, live it now, but also realize that you can change directions many, many times throughout your life. And when you look back, they're going to look like you know, blips on the timeline. You know, they're going to be pretty small moments compared to the whole long lifeline. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that that level of perspective is definitely very important. Uh, and it's, you know, it's never too late uh, because, you know, if you if you assign yourself a life sentence to something that you're not really interested or happy or satisfied in doing, boy, that makes your life a lot longer and not in any of the right ways. So uh, yeah. kudos to you for mm -hmm. making that realization. Uh, and then the transition for you, though, of course, was was it was a whole new world for you. The seeds had been planted, but you didn't have that experience. So you you adopted this experiment mindset. So talk to us a little bit about some of these experiments you did. My old website used to literally call the the DGTL Nomad, like the letters. It was terrible. Um, and I was <laughs> I was talking to my I was talking to my mom in Ohio when I was like 37 years old. I hate using all these numbers, but um, they're they're fairly irrelevant. But obviously they're relevant. Um, and I was talking to her, and and I said, you know, it's, it's called the digital nomad. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Like, I know it's something I might want to be, but I don't know if I want to be it. It's, I said, it's, it's more like a it's like an experiment. It's like a, it's like a nomad experiment. And like all these bells went off in my head, like this conversation literally happened and everything just went like, that's exactly what it is. And of course, I looked up all the socials on it and I was like, how does nobody have all of these things? And I, and I bought everything right there. The, the minute I started viewing everything as an experiment, I am wildly analytical. Like that's what I get paid for as a graphic designer and a brand designer is to really think through all of the avenues. And I've done that my whole life. So for me to, for someone to adopt this mindset of it's just an experiment, you don't have to win, lose, pass, fail. It's not black or white. It's just a fact finding mission. It's just an opportunity for you to see one way or the other, then make a decision and move forward to the next thing. You know, once I, once I grasped that, it really just changed the way that I was allowed to, you know, experiment with one more thing to find out whether the conjecture that I liked it was true or whether I really liked that thing. Um, and, you know, that was only five years ago. Um, but the things that have happened within those five years, once I opened up that door are just mind boggling. Whenever I look at my, you know, my monumentous moments, timeline of things that have changed or happened or, you know, events in my life over the past five years, it's, it's mind boggling. And it's all because I kind of opened up that door. Now you just mentioned that you, you're a, a graphic designer, uh, and, and is this you, and then you mentioned before that you were working in the architect, uh, were you working as an architect or you were working in that field? So what was the career transition that you experienced? I went to college as a graphic designer, brand designer, you know, specific, that was my um, emphasis throughout my uh, career. I migrated into signage and wayfinding design. So um, major airports, there's thousands and thousands of signs and a lot of them are elaborately designed and somebody needs to tell you what they look like, how they're built, where they're placed, exactly what words are on those things. So I designed these massive, or I helped design these massive programs for um, large architectural buildings, a lot of airports and things like that. So that became what I was known for in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and I had a lot of architects coming to me to be on their team as the local guy, the boots on the ground. And uh, so that was where, you know, these three to five year jo uh, contracts with massive, um, massive projects, they would start to overlap. So I'd have a five year project and then three years in, I'd get this other five year project and three years in, I get this other five year project where I couldn't get out. I had to really make this choice at some point to say, OK, if you if you want to travel nomadically, if you want to not be tied to a place, you're going to have to make a decision about your lifestyle and your clients. So what decision did you make and how did you make the transition? I had literally looked at the decision the preceding five years and the preceding five years, like <laughs> on almost clockwork. It was like every five years, this opening showed up between massive projects and that's and this this time the opening showed up and I was like, oh, man, I'm going to have to deal with this whenever they call me for my next big one. And sure enough, I had two separate architects that were that I worked with regularly, one out of Nashville, one out of Charlotte. They were they were bidding on the exact same project and it was going to be a 10 year project in Charlotte. They they both wanted me on my on their teams. I was going to get that job. And I had to call them both that day and say, look, I'm making a, a direction change in my life. Um, I love working with you all, but I'm making a decision and, you know, kind of talk them through that. And uh, 
one of them wasn't very happy. They thought that I just didn't want to work with them. And <laughs> I talk, called them a day or two later. I was like, no, really, the guys, like, this is just me making a change in my life. And once they figured that out, everybody was just like gung ho, like, go for it. Love, love that you're doing this. It's interesting as well that they were unable to perhaps see a way to continue to work with you on a location independent basis. I mean, obviously this was pre-pandemic, so perhaps perhaps they'd have a different way of working now uh, because I would say being a graphic designer, generally speaking, is a very digital nomad friendly career. Um, so if, if it wasn't in terms of what you were doing, then how did you make that transition? Uh, did you move into a different field with different clients or did you just find clients who were willing to hire you remotely? More specifically, that was probably more my choice than a dictation of choice. So I probably could have continued to work with them um, as a as as a a guy who grew up very blue collar, not with these big budgets, not with these multi million dollar projects that people are running in airports and things like that. Like my brain has still still has a hard time getting uh, around the the kind of money that corporate America throws around. So. I probably could have looked at those architects and said, hey, I'm, I'm going to be on these teams, but I'm just not going to be in Charlotte. You're going to have to fly me in and do the same things that you do whenever you come to Charlotte. Um, I'm just going to do those things. There was a point in my life where I said, you know, these projects are not making me as happy as as they are just paying my bills. And that's a, a huge, important theme for anybody listening to this podcast is you know, it's not just about the ducats. You need to figure out whether this is fulfilling for your life. So just because a job is a good one and just because you, you're grateful to have that doesn't mean that it's the thing you should be doing. And that's where I was. I knew that there were other things that I enjoyed doing more or things that I at least wanted to attempt to do. And, you know, a lot of a lot of people say, why are you throwing this away? Why are you giving all of this up? You know, that's a, what a, a lot of digital nomads are, are people that change their lives. They get that from their family. They get that from their friends or other people that don't quite understand things. And I have a huge problem with that mentality because the way I see it, anything you have done up to this point in your life, you can likely do again and you can do it just as well, if not better. Um, you may have to take a pay cut. You may have to, you know, have some backup plans, but in reality, you can almost take a, almost always take a step back to those things, unless you're burning bridges, unless you're you know just not being a good human being or a good business person. Um, so I knew I could make these changes, and if I needed to go back to those things, more than likely I could do that. Um, I had good relationships, but yeah, it was just a matter of saying, is this the right thing for me, or are there potentially better things out there for me? That resonates for me very much because that that was one of the things that gave me the courage to make that that ultimate leap into selling everything and selling my financial planning practice and hitting the road was the knowledge that I could come back and I could start a new financial planning practice and I could do it 10 times better than I did it the first time because I would learn from all the mistakes that I previously made. I also did not burn any bridges with the the company and the people that I were working with. I happened to know that you know, I had a bunch of clients who said, hey, listen, we're all for you doing this, but if you want to come back, um, we'll be your client again. There is something to be said for making sure that you don't burn any bridges, but then also to have that knowledge that everything you've done up to this moment is instrumental and can be instrumental in the future if you want to make more changes. I, I don't think I answered the what did I do next? Essentially from that moment forward, <clears throat> and I lost about 90% of my income based on those, you know, cutting those ties at that moment. From that moment on, the, the way that I led every new design relationship was with the reality that I could be working from anywhere in the world. My, the, the, the work that I'm going to be doing, the communication that I'm going to be keeping, all of the products that a client looks for from me as a, as a designer, those are going to remain the same. The difference might be time zones. The difference might be a little bit more flexibility and just a couple of realities. And that has never been an issue. If anything, it's been interesting. And they go, oh, wow, that's really cool. I can't wait to see where our next meeting is from. Like, as with most folks that you talk to, most of the time, the family and friends, even though reluctant in the beginning, they, they usually come around and they're, they're enamored by this new lifestyle and what it can bring. So um, that's what I had to do to kind of rebuild uh, my income so that I could be location independent. Speaking of income, you mentioned, of course, that you had dug yourself out of a heroic amount of debt uh, very quickly in your 30s. Uh, and now you have this budget minded uh, mindset. So can you talk to me a little bit about how you got yourself out of debt and how you apply some of the financial you know, practices that you have or things that you've learned in your current lifestyle? 
Can I just say that I love that you called it a heroic amount of debt? That makes it sound so awesome. <laughs> like, that debt was so cool. Um, no, I love that. I, I love that. Um, it, it probably would have been a lot easier for those four years if I would have thought about it that way. But um, so the, the tipping point for me was I was 28 years old. I was with somebody uh, who I thought, you know, was maybe moving towards marriage and kids. And, you know, she clearly thought differently at that point. And we, we parted ways. When we parted ways, I realized that I was so far in debt that I wasn't going to be able to support a relationship or, or I was going to bring so much stress and uh, those types of things to any later relationships that I didn't want to be in that place. So it really wasn't about me. It was about like future me and who, who I might end up with, which spoiler alert, still, still, uh, still hanging out solo. But, you know, I, I, I said to myself, I don't want to be in this position again, should these life events come up. And so that was really the precipice or the, 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 the beginning. I'm not sure if that's the right word to use the, the beginning of the thought process. And essentially I went out and I bought two books. I read them cover to cover in one night. I cut up all my business or my, uh, credit cards. And I, and I just dramatically changed the way that I was leading my life. I told my friends and family, I'm not going to be buying Christmas gifts this year. And I'm not going to be, you know, uh, going out to the bar. I think I gave myself $10 every two weeks for, um, what I called entertainment, which included my go out for a beer fund. Um, you know, I was so strict for those four years because I knew once that was done, it was going to be great. I had no idea how much stress all of that money and that debt had on me back then until now I live debt free. And I make sure my number one priority is to not be in debt. And, you know, even if I start to, to inch that way, I'm like, all right, dude, stop everything, do what you need to do and get your shit straight. Um, so yeah, it took four years, um, paid off everything except for my mortgage at that point. And then, uh, you know, there've been some bumps in the road ever since, uh, obviously with medical conditions and things like that, things get expensive and you just got to figure it out. But, um, once you learn how to live lean in number one, it doesn't feel lean, um, because it actually it seems to open up your your opportunities. Um, but yeah, it's it's just the biggest thing that anybody can do. And I know that sounds easy, like when you glaze it like that, like, it, but it's the most important thing people don't know they need to do if they've never been out of debt. Like, so. Well, and it sounds like reading these two books were pivotal for you in creating all of these new financial habits that now, of course, serve you very well in your current lifestyle. So what were the two books that you read? The one book that I didn't fully finish was The Seven Habits of Highly Effective uh, People, which I assume like the seventh chapter was finish all the books you start reading. Um, (laughs) And then (laughs) the other one was The Total Money Makeover, um, Dave Ramsey. You know, the way that book used to be written was you did it in order, which... um, you know, you've seen my book and, and it actually takes on that mindset of you can do these things in order or you can do them out of order. So there might have been a seed planted back then. But essentially, you know, the old total money makeover, I'm not sure how it looks now. You only read as much as you can accomplish. So once you get to a point where it's like, OK, you haven't done these things, well, you need to stop everything, accomplish these things in your financial life, and then you can keep moving forward. So I think I only ended up reading half of that book, too, because the first half was get your ass out of debt. And then the next half was start investing and start doing those different things. And, you know, it was quite a few years later. And, you know, I learned how to do those things on my own, you know, regardless of that book. But just the the mentality of that book of, you know, know where your money's at, know what it's doing, um, know every penny that you're spending, even though that sounds heavy. It's so easy for me now on a daily basis, especially since my life's a little bit you know, easier. I'm just not spending a lot of money on a regular basis. But I think if people don't know where their money is going all the time, um, if you ignore the five five dollar cups of coffee a week and the five six dollar beers a week, well, all of a sudden you're up to 60, 70 dollars a week times 52 weeks a year. Those that's hundreds, if not thousands of dollars that you just kind of ignore. And that's a massive amount of money to be ignoring in your life. So, um, yeah, it's it's a, something I could talk for days about. <laughs> well, you and me both, because I'm a big proponent of creative conscious spending and, and, and conscious really is the important word here. Really think about every dollar that you're spending and where, you know, 
is this enriching my life in a way that is worth the money that I'm spending? So, you, you know, I, I don't, Dave Ramsey calls it the latte factor, you know, all of those lattes, yeah. you know, are they really enriching your life that much? Or is there an alternative that will be just as satisfying to you, but cost a fraction of that trip to mm -hmm. the coffee shop uh, every day? And that can be applied on a variety of different levels. And especially, of course, in the full-time travel lifestyle, because <laughs> as you well know, full-time travel can cost as much as you want to spend, but it can also cost a lot less. And it really depends on what it is that you want out of an experience, how much that costs, and then of course, weighing whether or not that's worthwhile. And one of the tips that I have, one of the techniques that I have regarding budgeting in general, but also regarding now making your spending more conscious is I track every dollar I spend. And I do it with an app. It's very easy. Every time I spend the money, I just in input it into the app. And I, and I input the money without judgment. I don't feel guilty for the money that I spend. But some part of my brain knows that I'm going to have to put it in the app. And perhaps that's what triggers that, that process of thinking, okay, do I really need this? Is this... Is this going to help me in my life, in my career, in whatever it is that I want to achieve? The, the thing that I know us travelers, we also do, I think a lot of us do is, especially back in the United States, when we're in the United States, things cost so much for us in reality compared to a lot of the places we travel to. You start to get this, you see it through the lens of travel and you start to see it in the, what would this cost me in Portugal where I'm at right now? Or what would this cost me in Mexico? So for instance, if I'm going out for that $6 craft beer or $6 beer in, you know, the U S that's literally half of a night's stay in Mexico in, you know, some of the nicer hostels that I, that I stay in, or, you know, that's a six pack of beer that I can enjoy with, you know, friends in, in Mexico. So you start to see things through this lens of, do I really want to spend this money right now? And, and but you do, you do still need to be spontaneous. And I think, and I think that's the, the easy balance now is, you know, staying out of debt, knowing that you're strong with your finances, but also knowing that you need to live and you need to have, allow yourself those moments. And it just, it seems to become easier once you get out of the way of, of setting up those things. You had a, a really tough diagnosis of type one diabetes. Uh, I know that this is, I read an article that you wrote that was very detailed about how to travel with a medical condition. I had not even considered this kind of thing. Uh, so you really opened my eyes up a lot about what it is to, to travel with various forms of meds and prescriptions and how do you refill these abroad or get the extra. So please tell me what it's like i mean please tell me what the process was of, of of getting this diagnosis and how you felt and then how you've been able to deal with it from a location independent and a travel perspective yeah first and foremost for those of us that don't understand what diabetes is like a lot of us don't understand what diabetes is i had no clue even though i'd heard the word a million times um yeah so uh essentially uh within about 30 to 40 days uh, my eyesight completely went from perfect to I couldn't see anything. And then it went from near side to far side and near sighted, um, literally flipped back and forth every couple of days. Um, I was drinking a gallon and a half of water a day. I had cotton mouth. To, so I was drinking all this water, but I would go on a bike ride and I had it's like crazy cotton mouth and couldn't speak because it was so dry. Um, I lost 30 pounds in about oh. 40 days, uh, or sorry, 20 pounds in about, you know, 30 or 40 days. And, um, and I don't have a lot of weight to lose. Um, so I went from 165 to 144, um, in about a month. Um, so obviously by that point I had done some research, figured it, figured out what it was more than likely. And, uh, went back to Charlotte and, uh, was diagnosed type one diabetes, which type one is an autoimmune disease. So essentially your, you know, type two is often partly genetic, often caused by, um, you know, sedentary lifestyle or lack of exercise or bad eating habits can all contribute to these things, often genetic type one diabetes is an autoimmune disease. So essentially your body just woke up one day and said, I'm going to attack myself. Um, and that's where, you know, when you hear type one diabetes that we're not, that we're not making insulin, our body's not making insulin. It's because our body is attacking our pancreas and we're not making insulin anymore. So I am now an insulin dependent type one diabetic. Essentially I have to take insulin at every meal of the day, as well as, you know, some other times to make sure that my body can process the foods that I'm getting and, and deal with the sugar. So there's your quick 101. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot more to it. Um, but essentially, I was diagnosed with that and immediately thrown into this, you know, how do you afford these things? Or what do you afford? And I'm still figuring all that stuff out. Because, uh, as we know, certain medical issues in the US are pretty frustrating. Um, 
diabetics typically spend on average like ten thousand dollars a year um, whether they have insurance or not like these are averages <clears throat> um, so es essentially i sold my house went nomadic eight months later the pandemic hit eight months later i was diagnosed type 1 diabetic and now we are about eight, 10 months after that. And, you know, I got to the point where I was like, okay, well, you're not just going to sit back and not travel because of COVID. You're going to allow the world to get back to where it needs to get to, to be able to do that. But then I had to figure out if you're going to travel, you need to figure out what the type one diabetes. So um, a lot of travel medical insurances don't deal well with pre-existing conditions. They, mm -hmm. they kind of expect you to come at it pretty darn healthy. And if you aren't coming at it pretty darn healthy, they kind of say, eh, go, go find something somewhere else. There's a few uh, health insurance, uh, travel medical insurance companies that do cover pre-existing conditions or some of the ones that, that don't immediately. You can do things like get you know medical clearance that says this person is fit to travel when they're getting this policy. If something comes up with their pre-existing condition while during their travel, we couldn't have seen that coming because they were managing that condition. So these are a lot of things that I had to learn in the past few months was, you know, make sure that my doctors say, yes, you're fit for travel. I got it in writing by almost all of my doctors. I also have a heart condition um, and, a con and a kidney condition. So I had to have all three of my specialists say, no, you're, you're managing all these things. Well, there's no reason for you not to travel. Therefore, if I have a problem while I am traveling and I have my travel medical insurance, what they're going to do is they're going to say, well, wait, you got a problem with your diabetes. You shouldn't have been traveling. And we're going to say, nope, I am. They said I was fine. There's no issues. And therefore, they're going to cover those claims should something come up with my pre-existing conditions. You know, beyond that, I, I look like an amateur drug mule uh, coming <laughs> into, into uh, Portugal because I, I literally had to get um, from my doctors five months worth of my medications um, and insulin. So I, I came here with eight insulin pens, a bunch of needles, probably 300 pills for various different things. Um, so having those medications printed out, having, you know, medication printouts for my doctors in case I got asked questions at the borders or, um, coming through customs and immigrations, or let's say two of my insulin pens got frozen on the airplane. And now I need to figure out how I get more insulin because that was bound to happen eventually. It just so happened on my first flight uh, out of the country as, as a new type 1 diabetic. So, you know, I'm stopping at pharmacies. I'm asking questions here in this country. I know that the the insulin is cheaper here. Medical is cheaper in a lot of different countries uh, compared to the U.S. That's a pretty blanket statement that we can get behind. Um, yeah. So I knew that insulin is available here. Everybody around the world has medical conditions. So yeah. these were some of the mental hurdles that I just had to get over and say, you know, you're you know, you are not in this by yourself. There's a lot of people around the world dealing with similar things. How do they do it? What do they do whenever they need these things? And um, so I already know what the cost of insulin is here. You know, if I need to replace those pens that I ruined, I know what I'm going to have to spend, but it's the cost of doing business. Um, I'm not going to not travel. I'm just going to figure it out. And, and that's why I'm going to now write about these things a little bit more to help other people, you know, not just with the transitions in life and the transitions to being nomadic and traveling and, and just starting to travel, but obviously I, I now have this new angle to help people with because I got to learn it and I got to figure it out. So hopefully I can write it in a way to where it'll help some other people. I'm curious from an insurance perspective, how were you able to find an insurance company that was able to recognize that you were managing a pre-existing condition and ultimately to give you the insurance? So I use um, Insure My Trip, uh, which is an aggregator. And so insure my trip, you can essentially go on there and they'll uh, pull in policies from different travel insurance companies that, that are highly rated. And then you can narrow them down by the things that you need. So you can literally look at the ones that do cover pre-existing conditions or you can dig into the paperwork because some of them don't just come out, come right out and say, we cover this, we cover that. Um, you, this is the adulting part that, that sucks where you actually <laughs> do have to just kind of dig in and start reading or make some phone calls. I find it really odd that as a you know grown ass adult, I have the hardest time just picking up the phone and calling somebody and asking what I think are stupid questions sometimes. But you know, this person on the other end of the phone doesn't know who I am. I'm going to hang up and they're not going to think a thing of me. But for some reason, you know, I get, I think a lot of people get tripped up in that whole, you know, just, just pick up the phone and start making some phone calls and ask questions and asking them of two or three different folks. And if you didn't know what questions to ask, 
on the first one, by the second or the third one, you're going to go, oh, wait, I forgot to ask this or I'm learning that. And that's what I had to do here was, you know, I, I did my research. I read the things I needed to read, but then I just started making some phone calls and make sure that I understood those things and I understood how to execute them and, and what that might look like. And I, and I said, you know, if I had a problem, how do I follow through, you know, with a claim or this, that, and the other before I ever bought any of these plants. And, and that's what those folks are there to do is to make sure you understand what you need to understand before you buy their policies. Um, a lot of people just don't do it. We just want to ignore those things because they're messy and it's boring and yada, yada. But it's, at some point you can't do that because you're just in the dark. Yeah, you know what I mean? I, I always tell people to read their insurance policies from cover to cover. Uh, it, it's soul destroying work, but it, it was really important because... Uh, <laughs> When, when such a time is going to happen that you have to make a claim, boy, you better know exactly how to do that uh, because there are right from the time that something happens to you, there's a certain set of procedures that you have to follow. Otherwise, the insurance company can may not cover you. Uh, and also, too, I want to underscore, I want to second you on Insure My Trip as a great way to uh, have really specific filters for what kind of insurance policies you're looking for, and they will definitely spit out uh, the, the companies that you can work with. And then also to work with an insurance insurance company in that, you know, if they come back, if they do a medical questionnaire and then come back with a, okay, so we're going to give you a, an exclusion for this condition, uh, go back to them and say, well, what do you need in order to remove this exclusion? Do you need a doctor's report? That Because they will reevaluate. They will reevaluate your policy. I've had that happen in the past where they've put, uh, you know, they. I had a heart murmur when I was like 16 years old and 20 something years later, they're like, oh, we're going to exclude any condition that, uh, you know, has to do with with your heart uh, on the road. I'm like, are you kidding me? This was like an exercise induced asthma that I had a, you know, a million years ago. So eventually they did remove that exclusion because they realized, you know, with the doctor's report saying, no, it's okay. Like you say, if you get the report saying I'm fit for travel uh, or whatever it is the insurance company needs you to say, uh, it can definitely, uh, they will restructure your policy accordingly. Yeah. The for term sure. they use often is, is a medical waiver. Essentially, yeah. your doctor is saying this person is fit for travel. Um, sometimes they use different terms, but that's the, the low-hanging fruit term that you'll probably see. Yeah. All right. I really want to talk more about some of your uh, nomad experiments because in your book, your book is very fun. It's written uh, it, uh, in a very, as you've got a lot of tough love in your book, uh, definitely, for but it is written for people who don't have much or any travel experience, are not really sure even where to begin in terms of uh, adopting a, a nomadic lifestyle. But you did it with so much fun in terms of your nomad experiments. So what are some of the experiments that you did that ultimately helped you launch a new lifestyle? So again, early on, I started trying hostels and trying couch surfing. And that was, you know, 10, 12 years ago. So it was just a matter of, of finding, you know, that was well outside of my comfort zone. So what do I need to do to get into my comfort zone? And that was, you know, finding a hostel that I felt was, you know, that I felt safe enough going to, because, you know, that's one of the things that people don't want to try out. Oh, are they safe? Are they dirty? Are they the same? Well, find a fancy one, you know? So, you know, figure out, figure out the things that make you feel comfortable, at least trying to take one of those steps. So I started trying those things early on. And in my late thirties, um, I had never really traveled domestically very much. Um, and, and I was always a little bit fearful of traveling solo just cause it's always easier if you can have somebody there to hold your hand and teach you how to do things or show you the ropes. So I wasn't doing those things, but finally, finally I said, okay, you got to start trying. So I, I took some domestic trips. Um, you know, I would take a five day trip to Philadelphia. I would take a five day trip to Portland and, you know, I could, I could work while I was on the road. So, you know, that might sound expensive, but when you're staying in hostels and when you're using uh, travel miles to get free flights and you're still working on the road, it's really just about, you know, for somebody who has created that flexibility for themselves, it's just picking up your life and dropping it into another place for a week. You know, those first experiments in my late thirties were just start traveling domestically a little bit. Um, and then, I always thought about van life and I've conjectured for two or three years that I would like van life. And I'm like, dude, before you just sell your house and go buy a van and think that that's going to be awesome. And then you just hate it. Maybe you should try it. So I went and bought a shitty old van that was already built out and you know, it had a camper, like it was ready to go. It was an old 85, 1985 G10 baby blue camper van. Um, you can see that on the nomad experiment, just search for van. Um, it's gorgeous. 
And I went to Shenandoah. I went to Shenandoah National Park and I camped there for a week and I worked out of the back of the van. I hiked the Appalachian Trail, you know, some parts of the Appalachian Trail there. And I did what I thought van life might look like, which was live in a different place, also get my work done, also get my exercise done, do all of those things. And I tested it. You know, you have to move beyond conjecture. And and, then I think I'm going to like that. Um, That sounds awesome. You got to give it a try. So that's where my mindset was, was let's give it a try. And then, you know, probably the most important ones, and there were many, but probably the most important one was, uh, I think three years ago, I said, okay, you're still traveling domestically, but what are you going to do to really push your comfort zone? And I, so I gave myself a goal to not sleep in my bed a quarter of the year, to not sleep in my home um, a quarter of the year. So, so whether that was just staying at a friend's house or staying in a different city or, or, or that was pushing me to, to try to not use my house and my home as a crutch. And once I got through that year, I was like, well, that worked out pretty good, but you know, I don't progress is only progress. If you keep moving, you know, forward. So I said, well, what are you going to do next year? And I said, well, let's do a third of the year. So that was 122 days. And I did that. And, and by the time I did that, that was between those two years was also my first trip to Mexico. That was my third country. I bought a one-way ticket to Mexico because back to that whole conjecture thing, do you really think living out of a backpack and traveling the world with only the things on your back is going to be fun? Maybe you should give it a try. So I bought a one-way ticket to Mexico and I just said, all right, I'll start in Mexico city and see how long I go. Maybe I'm uncomfortable after four days and I just decide to come home. That's fine. That's an experiment. Learn what you're going to learn and you know, move on. But, you know, I stayed in Mexico city for a week and then somebody said, you should go down to Oaxaca. It's smaller and you'll probably like it more. So I said, how do I do that? And they're like, go buy a bus ticket. So I bought a bus ticket, drove to, or went to Oaxaca. Then I ended up in Puerto Escondido with four or five new friends that I met in Oaxaca. Once I got through that second year of 122 days, not sleeping in my bed, my comfort zone of my home, what used to be my comfort zone, what I used to go home to and go, oh, I'm so calm here. And I get to, I get to go to my garden and I get to do these things. It became more of a stressor to me than travel had. They flipped. Um, because all the chores and the maintenance and all of the things that came with my home were not as good as the freedom and the exhilaration and just the, the, the amazing things that travel were starting to bring to me, not only from a, you know, outside of me standpoint, but, but growth inside of me. And, you know, I realized at that point, I was like, all right, I don't need to do any more experiments. Like I'm ready to really try what's next. And that's when I decided to sell my house and, Um, move on. And people ask me like, do you miss it? Do you look back? It's been two and a half years and I've literally driven by that house three or four times. And the only reason I drove by it was to make sure that they didn't, they didn't cut down my favorite Japanese maple tree because I would (laughs) would be having some words if they did, but I haven't missed it at all because of these new growth experiences that I'm able to have in this current chapter of my life. If I wake up tomorrow and I want to get another mortgage on a house, I can do that. If I wake up tomorrow and I want to be in one place, I can do that. But right now, I'm open to, you know, all the things that this is bringing. This is perfect because this ties back to what we were talking about earlier with regards to career transitions and the knowledge that you can always change tack if you want to. And adopting this experiment mindset is a fabulous way to ease yourself into new things, but also not to make any drastic measures that you might later come to regret. Uh, so, you know, van life is a perfect example. I had a, uh, I, I didn't even view it as an experiment, but I had a six week camper van trip, at which point I realized van life probably isn't for me. Um, good <laughs> lesson learned. Tick, I'm glad I didn't buy a van. Uh, and and like you said, just been able to, to dip your toe in the water and see how it feels of different ways of living, different ways of traveling, different time periods of traveling. I always suggest if people are looking at, at traveling long-term or even full-time, you don't necessarily sell everything yet, right? Take a test trip, go away for a few months, see how that feels. Maybe you will realize that it's not your cup of tea, or maybe you'll realize there's a different way to do it than how you initially envisioned. So your mindset of the experiment is a brilliant way to try new things out and to ease into a transition that might otherwise seem really overwhelming. This is also just a quick side note. This is also a way to disarm your friends and your family, the ones that are looking at you going, what, what are you going to do? You know, I, there were, uh, with the one-way ticket to Mexico, I, I sat down at a corporate dinner with like eight people and they're like, you're going to do what? Is that safe? <laughs> all, the, all the silly things you hear. 
And I looked at him, I was like, eh, it's just an experiment. Like if it doesn't work, I'll come back. And, and it really does give those around you who, who can be a lot of pressure on your life, the ability to go, okay, they have it under control. It's, it's not that big of a deal. They're, they're fully capable. Um, so it really does it help to disarm your family and friends, especially if you're really trying some, some crazier things, what might be considered some crazier things. I hadn't even thought of that, but that is an, another brilliant way to be able to frame it for people in your life who may otherwise not understand the decisions you're making uh, and to make sure that they will support you in that way. Well, you know, I feel like we could go on forever uh, and I think we could, we could go on for another couple of hours, but uh, I do want to wrap this one up and I want you to please tell us uh, where people can find your book and, and where the people can connect with you online. So the nomad uh, that's my website. Uh, if you want to check out the book, go there, uh, look in the shop notes. You can you find it on the website very easily. The next best place to follow me is probably on Instagram, which is Instagram forward slash the nomad experiment. And I do love photography. I mix that photography with some of this other, you know, self-help, motivational, philosophical stuff about travel and, you know, overcoming some of these hurdles. So that's kind of when I'm when I'm not writing a book. That's where I get my photo and words fix is to kind of have some of those conversations on the Instagram and uh, love it when people reach out to me on there. So do you have any final words that you would like to leave with us? Something that you would put up on a billboard to tell the world? Oh, just stop waiting. Uh, just stop waiting and start figuring it out like sooner rather than later. You're never going to be ready. No matter what we're talking about, you're never going to be ready. So you might as well just get started at it now. Awesome. Brilliant advice. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jason. It's been a pleasure. I'm Nora Dunn, otherwise known as the Professional Hobo, and I will catch you next time.